Welcome at Aquaba. My name is Daphne Neal, and I am the Vice President of the African American Association of Ghana, also known as AAAG. In celebration of Black History Month 2021, the African American Association of Ghana, in collaboration with the U.S. Embassy Ghana American Corner, has held a series of webinars focusing on the theme, the Black family, representation, identity, and diversity. Today, we're presenting the third webinar in the series entitled, The Black Family Through the Lenses of Black Artists. Our panelists this evening have many things in common. They are all educators, scholars, community activists, and published authors. With us this evening are Ms. Faraha Youngbud, a poet, a writer of short stories and plays, and a communications consultant. She has worked as a writer in television and radio and as a teacher of English and history in several American international schools around the world. Her latest project is operating a retreat facility in the Republic of Panama called Cat-Eyed Woman Communications. We also have with us this evening, Dr. Donna Akiba Sullivan Harper, a Langston Hughes scholar and recently retired professor from Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. While at Spelman, she served six years as chair of the English department and three as the president of the faculty council. She is one of just three now chairs at the college and served a two-year term as dean of undergraduate studies. Dr. Harper completed her undergraduate degree at a historically black college, Hampton University, and chose to devote 32 years of her career to Spelman, another historically black college. Also with us is Mr. Jason Vassar Elam, essayist, poet, and spoken word artist, born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, with roots in Cameroon, Central Africa. He has been co-director co for the Wellston Book Project, a teaching artist with the Center of Creative Arts. And this is a project which enriches lives and builds community through the arts, and the coordinator for the Writers in the Schools program a program that connects professional writers with public school classrooms. And finally, we have Dr. Opal Palmer Adisa, an award-winning poet, novelist, children's author, curator, photographer, performance artist, and storyteller. Dr. Adisa has 22 titles to her credit, former distinguished professor of creative writing and literature in the MFA program, and the Diversity Studies Program at the California College of the Arts. She taught for 23 years. Currently, she is the Director of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies at the University of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica. Her most recent honor, having been recently chosen to participate in a global virtual literary festival taking place this month. So as you can see, we have a very distinguished panel this evening. Each panelist will begin with a 15 minute presentation about the black family through his or her lens. And after everyone has spoken, we will take questions from the audience. You're welcome to post questions in advance in the chat box and we will hold them until the Q&A time. We will begin this evening's program with Ms. Youngblood. Okay, there. Hello, everyone. Um, several years ago, the mental illness called post-traumatic stress disorder was uh, being discussed among different circles, intellectual, medical, and so on. And, uh, and so it caught my attention because I wanted to just talk about how it's described. It is a mental illness and it's triggered by a terrifying event, either experiencing it or witnessing it. Symptoms may include flashbacks, nightmares, and severe anxiety, as well as uncontrollable thoughts about the event. And so the question arose, are we as Black people suffering from PTSD? Now remember that PTSD is incurable. There is no cure for it. And so what does this mean for us as a people? Are we suffering from a disease that has no cure? And so my response to it was, written in a poem that I did that I want to read to you about how we deal with this whole notion of PTSD since there is no cure. 
It's in part three of this uh, poem that I wrote, and it's under the headline, Doctor's Orders. If we are not suffering from PTSD, it is unlikely that our condition merits sustainable treatment. No HeLa cells meant to cure us, only the natural order of privilege and wealth over poverty and dependence to benefit those who have the power to usurp Henrietta's link to immortality for their exclusive use. Never you mind. We had our medicine, unadulterated music to soothe our souls, mend our bodies. Our healers were Lady, the Prez, Dizzy, Bird, Satchmo, Train, Sassy. In our gut, we knew how it felt to be down so long that down don't worry me. Not even the angels could blow like Ornette, Ben, Illinois, Pharaoh, Hodges, Rasan, Miles. Their notes floating, floating, floating on rivers of melody, rhythm emptying into our traumatized souls to drown images of black bodies swinging from the poplar tree. Our royalty included a duke, a count, masters of the keyboard in a circle made up of McCoy, Nina, Thelonious, Herbie, Mary Lou, Oscar, Fats, Ray, whose passionate fingers stroked, caressed, pounded, coaxed immortal music from keys of ivory and ebony. Didn't it rain, children? Oh, my Lord, didn't it? Oh, didn't it? Oh, my Lord, didn't it rain? High heel shoes, fur coats swinging in a strut perfected by black women. Gibson electric guitar strapped, quivering, eager to obey her every command. Sister Rosetta Tharp schooling wannabe rock and roll neophytes, Chuck, Keith, Mick, unashamedly worshiping, wishing, absorbing every morsel of gospel to cross over and dispel the sanctified Holy Ghost. I'm a blues man, but I'm a good man. B.B. in his own defense, Percy Mayfield taking our hand to accept the river's invitation, Empress Bessie, Queen Ida, King Pleasure, secured their place in our hearts and in our gospel blues, rhythm and blues and jazz. And when literacy was no longer a crime punishable by death, our poets lent their pens to paper to enrapture our eyes with words that sang to our souls, reviving our spirits. The futility of classifying our condition to fit into a denial of centuries of brutality, terror, and white supremacy has made meaningless PTSD. And this is from the volume of poetry that I published a few years ago called Catching Water and Other Adventures Along the, the, the Coast of Arriba, which is the coast here in, in Panama. And so what does, it, what does it mean to have been exposed to be, have been in the cauldron of what has happened to us and how the deliberate destruction of the Black family occurred? What happened? And so I wanna go back to where it all began in the African context. In Africa, the family was the heart of the community and the community was the heart of the nation. And in the family, everyone, everyone had a place. There were no strangers, there were no loose people. And so whether it was patriarchal or matrilineal, Everyone had a place, there was structure, there was organization, everyone knew to whom he or she belonged. And in some West African societies, scarring or the cuts on the face was to identify the members of a particular family and group so that there was never any, never any reason to not know who you belong to. And so all of that changed when there was the Arab and European slave traders who weakened these systems on the continent. And the effects of it, even though slavery as it occurred in the so-called Americas was not the same in Africa, the impact of the slave trade weakened the family structure in Africa. It did not destroy it, but it weakened it. And so the colonial will, the colonialism was installed but the family unit was not destroyed. It was altogether a different proposition 
for the enslaved Africans who survived the Middle Passage and were dumped on the shores of the so-called New World. Even the concept of family was deliberately destroyed. On the continent, women were at the center of the family. Also, they, the mother, they were, as mothers, they were responsible for the upbringing of the children. As wives, they were responsible for upholding the reputation of their husbands. As daughters, they were responsible for upholding the reputation of their fathers. Africa, African men were enslaved, more African men were enslaved than African women and transported to the Americas. And this is the first breach in the notion of family. In the Americas, the enslaved women were raped, they were brutalized, they were prey to every degenerate, degraded white men from the sailors on the slave ships to the rich planters, every degradation that could be inflicted on them. Forced to bear children from their rapist, or in many cases, from their adult sons. Thus, we have the term MF, which is something that we all ought to be aware of and never, ever, ever allowed to be used. This is where that term comes from from these women forced to sleep with their own adult sons to procreate more children. And so given all of this that was happening to them in that cauldron of slavery, these women, these people still tried to create families from the bits and pieces that were left to them. They would take, they, they, they were not allowed to form families, they were allowed, they never knew when their mates, when their spouses, when their children would be taken from them. And as a consequence of that, their ability, their natural need to express affection was stunted. They could not afford to engage in loving anyone because that love could be taken from them when their children were sold, when they were taken away from them, when their mates were taken away from them. And so as a consequence of that, it is to the women that I want to address my love and appreciation and for all of what they did as the center of these families that they created out of the bits and pieces that were left to them, they were determined that they would never allow their sense of love, even though it had to be buried with them, they would never allow it to be destroyed. And so they gathered unto themselves all of these bits and pieces. They took care of each other's children they took care of each other as women in a community. They took care to make sure that everything that they had could be shared. They took care, and I am reminded when I say that their emotional, the natural emotions to love were stunted because the slave masters would not allow them to show any love or caring for one another. They were not allowed to do it. And I'm reminded of the scene from beloved where baby Suggs is in the clearing and she's preaching and what and how what she understands of how important it was for us as a people to be able to express how we felt and so her command was for the children to laugh because in enslavement the children were not allowed to laugh they had no lives that allowed them to be happy and free and to laugh so her command was for those children to laugh and for the men the men were to dance because in African society, men do dance, but in the Americas, in enslavement, they were not allowed to dance. They were allowed only to do back-breaking work from sunup to sundown. And for the women, her command was for them to cry because again, being deprived of their children, to be deprived of their spouses, they were not allowed to cry. They were not allowed to express these feelings. 
And so when this scene came up in Beloved with baby Suggs, it testifies to the resilience of Black people, of the resilience to hold on to what they had experienced and lived on the African continent where the family was the heart of the society. And at the heart of the family was the woman, whether she was the mother, the grandmother, the aunt, the big sister, wherever it was, it was the woman who was at the center of the family. And Daphne, I just need to have some sense of my time. Sorry, you have about seven minutes remaining. Okay, then, then, then where I wanted to go from there is to talk about the black woman, the mother. And this is also, this is from my first um, work. And it's called, Whatever Happened To. Give me a moment, I just have to go and get it. I thought I had it right next to me, just give me a moment. Okay, this poem is my tribute to Black women who to me are at the heart of the Black family. And it's called, Where Did They Go? Whatever happened to Lula Bell from Jackson, Cora Lee from Shreveport, Betty Jean from Montgomery, Dorothy Ann from Jasper, Mayetta from Little Rock, Lizzie from Memphis. What about the whereabouts of Ruby? Opal, Pearl, and Sapphire. Country women, Southern gals, but they were somebody's mama, somebody's, somebody's baby girl, somebody's nana, somebody's auntie, somebody's big sister. Saturday, press and curl, the kitchen surrenders first to sweat. Stockings to church in 95 degree heat, cause the Lord must have his due. Brogans in the fields and slippers in the kitchen. Body worn out by 40 when needed most to keep a straying man at home. Brought to tears by Mahalia's songs, crunching letters to sound schooled, bearing witness to a friend's pain, minding children instead of her needs, getting happy and shouting to keep from cutting somebody's throat. How did we lose these women? Maybe shame and sounding country opened the door and allowed them to be taken. Was it infatuation with city life that muted our voices of protest? Or perhaps we were seduced by Kunta Kente after a generation of Brie, Kim, Sean, Natasha, and Brendan failed to boost us up the ladder of respectability. They were women you could trust with your child, money, or man. They didn't play. Life drove a hard bargain and they didn't renege. Solid names for solid women. Maybe if we look inside Granny's broom closet or Nana's left-hand dresser drawer or under Papa's footstool, we might find where they took refuge. And to end uh, this part of the presentation, I just want to talk a little bit about how it felt to live in an African community and to experience what family was there, what it was like there. I worked and lived in Africa for 10 years, and I got a chance to see up close what family life was like, not only in the city, but in the village. And always at the center was the woman, was the mother, the grandmother, the aunt. And there was this hierarchy. And as I said before, it didn't matter if the society was patriarchal or matrilineal. There was organization and there was structure. The older ones always looked after the younger ones. And the, the families were part of a community. No one was isolated. No one lived off by themselves. Everyone was connected. Every family knew every other family. And so that sense of what family is, is what I enjoyed being in Africa and having been born in the South and not brought up there, but all of the traditions and everything else that my parents and grandparents had experienced 
were brought out to California when I was taken there when I was still a child. But as an adult going and living in Africa, all of that, all of that now I understood exactly where that came from. And it's just so interesting that here I am in Panama and it is the same structure. The families here are multi-generational. You have the grandparents, you have the parents and you have the children all living together in one place. There are no isolated families. All of the families are connected. And so this again comes directly from that African experience, from the structure, from the organization, from that, that caring for the elders, the elders, and then going on down to the children. Everyone is cared by someone else, either older or younger. And so there is this sense of the Black family that has survived. And regardless of what we are experiencing now, we still have at the heart of every Black family that DNA of the African experience of what a Black family was composed of and how it is still able to be strong enough to resent all of the attempts to destroy it. And these attempts have been deliberate and they are ongoing, but we have within us, we have within us the, the heart, the love that will take us through. Thank you for AHA. We really appreciate the presentation. Next, we'll have Dr. Harper. You need to unmute yourself. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am going to share my screen. And I... Yeah, see, it works so well in practice. You know how these things go? Let's try this again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like okay. when you take children out and they misbehave. <laughs> there we have it. African-American authors have drawn from their own lives and from lives they have observed to reveal some model behaviors and some cautionary tales about things we should avoid at all costs. Fiction protects actual names and reputations from being exposed to public scrutiny. And the author can exaggerate or erase certain kinds of behaviors with the license granted to the creative writer. I have selected three works from the 20th century to discuss how the protagonists find support for their own individual needs, whether within or apart from the nuclear family. We will view a simple story from Langston Hughes's Simple's Uncle Sam, then Langston Hughes's first novel, Not Without Laughter, and finally, Alice Walker's first novel, The Third Life of Grange Copeland. We can only scratch the surface of what is offered in these works, but perhaps your curiosity will be piqued and you will delve into more of what these and other brilliant authors have to say. Langston Hughes had a complex childhood, which included seeing his parents divorce when he was just a child. He mostly lived with his mother, but also spent formative years with his maternal grandmother, with a family friend, and with his father, all in separate households. He tells his story in The Big C. Langston Hughes is best known as a poet. However, the collected works of Langston Hughes will show that his volumes of prose far outnumber the pages he devoted to poetry. His character, Just Be Simple, emerged in the Chicago Defender in 1943. And the last volume of Simple Stories 
that Hughes edited was published in 1965. In that collection, Simple's Uncle Sam, the protagonist, Just Be Simple, better known as Simple, recalls being a passed around child, similar to Langston Hughes himself. Although Simple received clothes and had a safe place to sleep, he did not feel the stability and the love that a family should offer. Talking to his friend, Simple says, I was thinking about my old aunt, who was not really my aunt, but who was my father's stepfather's sister, and who took me in and took care of me while my mother was away somewhere. I were a passed around child. Nobody was mean to me. I do not know why I had that left out feeling, but I did, I guess, because nobody ever said, you're mine. And I did not really belong to nobody. When I got big and grown up, I took for my theme song in my early manhood years, that old record of Billie Holiday's, which says, God bless the child that's got his own. If I had a child, be he or she, girl or boy, I would make sure that I kept that child with me and it were my own and I were his own. Since I married my second wife, Joyce, I do not have that left lonesome feeling so much anymore, but it took me a long time to find somebody you wanna come home to where the house does not feel empty, even with somebody in it. It is bad for a full grown man to come home to somebody who is not there. Even if they have got dinner ready, for a little small child, it is worse. That nobody home that belongs to you feeling, even if the house is full of people, it is not enough for them to just be there. If they do not have a little love for whoever lives in the house with them, it is an empty house. If you have somebody else living in the house with you, be it man or woman or child, relative, friend, adopted, or just taken in, or even if it is just a rumor paying rent, even if you give them no money and not a piece of bread or anything, if you got a little love for whoever it is, it will not be an empty house. But if nobody cares, it is an empty house. I have lived in so many empty houses full of peoples. I do not want to live in a crowded, empty house, no more. So we have been inside the mind and the memories of one person in the household. We do not really know how the other people around felt, but we clearly see that Simple felt unclaimed, unvalued, and even unloved. This story, Empty Houses, reveals a poignant introspection by a character known for being humorous. Smokey Robinson sang about the tears of a clown, and we all know that people who joke around can be deeply wounded inside. Langston Hughes's first novel, Not Without Laughter, replicates some of the passed around difficulty that had been experienced by Hughes himself and by his character, Simple. Although young Sandy Rogers has parents who remained married, he lives primarily with his mother, his young aunt Harriet, and his maternal grandmother Hager. These three characters represent different values. Grandmother is deeply religious. Sandy's mother, Angie, works arduously and is always yearning for her husband. Sandy's absent father is trying to find work a kind of employment that is not available in the town where his wife and mother-in-law live. However, he returns home periodically, playing the guitar, singing the blues, and prompting his young sister-in-law, Harriet, to dance and sing, much to the outrage of his mother-in-law. Now, this is a quick sketch of the complicated extended family that occupies Not Without Laughter. 
In this novel, however, Hughes allows the reader to realize that every one of these different characters has something good to offer Sandy. Even though their religion and their low wage work cannot lift the family up from poverty and struggle, Sandy's mother and grandmother represent faith and hard work. Sandy's grandmother tries to find the good in everyone, even white people who have done some terrible things to some of the characters who testify in the novel. Sandy's young aunt Harriet horrifies her mother Hager, Sandy's grandmother, by working in the entertainment industry as a circus performer, a sex worker, and a blues singer. Yet she and Sandy's father help the young man to appreciate the blues music and the joy that music and dance can offer. Sandy would certainly not have gained such appreciation from his mother or grandmother. Sandy also has an older aunt, Tempe Siles, who values upper class lifestyle behaviors, even to the point of seldom visiting her mother, her sister, or Sandy. When she does visit one, son, one Christmas, she is described as having the air of the mistress of the manor descending to the servants' quarters. She seems so stiff that one would never guess her mother's home had been her home at one time. And when she left, the novel says, everybody felt relieved as though a white person had left the house. Nevertheless, Sandy's pretentious Aunt Tempe tries to rise to the call when Sandy needs to be cared for. His grandmother has died. His mother is out in some unknown location searching for her husband. Harriet has left to work in the entertainment industry. So Tempe offers her home to her nephew and opens Sandy's eyes to the benefits of books. In his grandmother's house, the only books were the Bible and some fairy tales Tempe had given him. Aunt Tempe's house, however, contains many magazines and books. Sandy becomes an even better student with her strict rules and her many books. He is especially impressed with the powerful writing of W.E.B. Du Bois. As he read those things in the Crisis magazine, which Tempe had been subscribing to as a member of the NAACP since the magazine was first published. Sandy, I read from the novel, Sandy had heard of that magazine, but he had never seen a copy. So he went through them all, looking at the pictures of prominent Negroes and reading about racial activities all over the country and about racial wrongs in the South. In every issue, he found two stirring and beautifully written editorials about the frustrated longings of the Black race and the hidden beauties of the Negro soul. So that large family that is represented in Not Without Laughter includes a variety of characters who are missing in Langston Hughes's own life. But that novel, with all of its characters, can guide us to respect the differences in our own various family members. Even when folks worship differently, or not at all, they can bring elements of love, art, and encouragement into our lives. Even when folks are haughty and judgmental, they may have resources that can help guide young people to greater opportunities. Finally, in this whirlwind tour of family representation in African-American literature, I want to end with a living author who remains prolific and politically active, Alice Walker, who recently celebrated her 77th birthday. Her first novel, The Third Life of Grange Copeland, diverges far from her own autobiographical details, although her family in Eatonton, Georgia, did work as sharecroppers. She did not experience the dysfunction that dominates this first novel. 
I specifically added this novel to my presentation because of last week's discussion of generational trauma. So this novel offers a way to end some of the cycles of tragedy through elements of responsibility, change, and redemption. The title character, Grange Copeland, has treated his first wife and his only child miserably. That son, Brownfield Copeland, grows up to replicate the drunkenness, physical abuse, and verbal abuse he observed as a child. But he goes even further with his abuse and ends up in prison. With his son in prison, Grange Copeland realizes the generational trauma his own behavior has caused. He becomes the official guardian for his granddaughter, Ruth, and he does everything he knows how to do to prepare her for surviving and thriving in the world. He provides many books, he teaches her oral folklore, he teaches her songs, dances, he teaches her recipes, he acquaints her with the Bible, he saves money for her college expenses, and he teaches her how to shoot a gun, he teaches her how to drive, and he gives her a car. And what he says is that survival was not everything. He had survived, but to survive whole was what he wanted for Ruth. A crucial part of this survival whole was the importance of accepting responsibility for what a person has done. His son, Brownfield, never learns to accept responsibility for his actions. Grange confronts his son, but he speaks to Ruth, his granddaughter. Your daddy's taught me something I didn't know about blame and guilt. You see, I figured he could blame a good part of his life on me. I didn't offer him no directions and he thought no love. But when he become a man himself with his own opportunity to right in the wrong I, I, I done to him, he could have been good to his own children. He had a chance to become a real man, a daddy in his own right. That was the time he should have just forgot about what I done to him and to his mom. But he messed up with his children his wife and his home, and never yet blamed himself. And never blaming himself done made him weak. So this grandfather was not able to undo the damage he did to his son, but his son did not attempt to do better as Just Be Simple had said he wanted to do with any child that he became responsible for. However, Grange Copeland pours into his granddaughter all the good things that he knows. In all three examples, we see an extended family at work. Sometimes it works effectively, sometimes it fails. We might gain positive lessons by seeing how Aunt Tempe steps in for her nephew and by witnessing the way Grange Copeland steps in for his granddaughter. We all know the proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. We all need to do what we can to help be that supportive village as Langston Hughes and Alice Walker have demonstrated in their fictional works. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Akiva Sullivan. And next we're here from Mr. Jason Baster Elon. Hello, and thank you for having me. Um, I should start by prefacing this by by saying, like Langston Hughes, I too grew up in a single parent home. Um, to Faraha's point, you know, the, the notion of the black mother is, is such a, a fixture in our, in our memories and in our lives. But I wanna go so far as to say, as the fixture of the black father is equally salient. And so though my father wasn't in the home with me, I, I had him in my life, and he did have an influence of who I became as a man. And so I'll begin with a poem for my mother, taken from my collection of poetry, Shrimp, entitled Character. Some days, I would study my mother, watch how she smiled, 
even when I knew she was hurting. Somehow, her eyes were crescent moon, her mood steady like beets on a plate, cantaloupe in the fridge. Her kids oblivious that the apple circles were not apple jacks, nor that we did not have, because we always had what we needed. And so in that, we grew up without our father in the home. I had father figures. I had, you know, more than one mother. You know, I had a community of people, a village that took an interest in my life. And because of that, because of that village, I saw examples of what success looked like in the real world. I was able to see what successful marriages looked like. You know, how relationships should persist in our society. And so though I wish that my mother and father could have worked it out, I also am thankful that I had the upbringing that I had even though. You know, I'm thankful that I was able to, to become who I am even in those circumstances because it's possible to do that. So if there's a child out there listening to this presentation, you know, a mother, a father, someone who has gone through a divorce, Success can happen even in those moments. And so I want to make sure that there's room for that as well. As a black man growing up in a, in a, in a single parent home, I had certain, um, had certain things that were always going to be up against me. I had certain uh, adversity that I had to endure. For example, I, I grew up not knowing how to talk to girls. I grew up, you know, not really knowing how to tie a tie you know, or how to respectfully interact with other boys my age. But I learned how to do those things by watching others. Um, so though my father wasn't there to teach me how to tie the tie, I eventually learned how to tie the tie. Though my father wasn't there to teach me how to talk to girls, I eventually found out how to talk to girls. And so in my life, I've become sort of uh, a fixture of my father, but also the other men in my life. You know, the, the teachers at school, um, the postman that, would, that knew that uh, I had gotten in trouble at school somehow. Um, uh, my, my best friends and their fathers. You know, I became, I had bits and pieces of these different men that um, sort of made a father for me. And then I also had my dad, you know, who um, as I got older, I learned to appreciate differently than I had when I was a child. And so as a young man, I grew up angry. You know, I didn't understand why I was angry, but I had issues that had a, took a toll on my personality, I would say. And so this next poem entitled Subtra Subtraction actually goes into some of that, what, what some of that can look like. Today, I sit with who I have become, waiting for the blood to be cleaned from responsible hands that stand where it all happened. Before concrete and city, the streets before the clocks held on to bricks, their hands moving as the sun moves, where before these trees were planted, other trees grew. Thinking of today's math in Banyar Guards Trinidad, wondering about my own response, my own manner of moving across time. And I'm left with looking into a mirror at the face of what it looks like, years after trees have been dug up, after new ones have been planted. And so in that poem, I'm really looking at what it looks like to have something taken away from me as a young man and how I re reinstitute those things in, in different ways, how I pick out different parts of what it means to be a man, you know, what it means to be a young black man in particular. Um, I want to share a quick story before I move on to the next poem. Recently, I was, I was driving my, my brand new car on the highway and I had one of my nephews in the car with me with my wife. And as we were merging onto the highway, someone was speeding past. Um, not wanting to allow me to get on the highway. And so I was, I was enraged, honestly, but I couldn't show that. I had to be, I had to show poise because I knew my nephew was in the car with me 
and he was watching how I reacted. And so I remained calm to the point where I asked if everyone was okay. We merged without anyone getting hurt and we went along our way. But the lesson in that is that he, he watched me handle that situation. I didn't have to be his father for, for him to watch me in that situation. He didn't have to be my son for me to impart wisdom. And so again, to Faraha's point, and much to, um, to Dr. Harper's point as well with Langston, you know, we find ourselves in, these, in these, these familial spaces where we learn from one another. And though I, I don't have any children of my own, I do have children. I have people who look up to me in different ways. Though I'm not a father, I impart fatherly wisdom in different ways. And so in, in being in the Black family, there's strength in also having siblings. I was blessed to have uh, two siblings um, uh, from my father and many other siblings throughout the family unit. But particularly the, the sibling is, I think, one of the, the unsung heroes of the Black family because it's in those, those relationships that people learn how to deal with life. You know, I, I thank God that I was not a single, um, that my, my parents didn't have just me, you know, because I, I was raised um, in a community. And so um, one, this last poem I'm gonna share is for one of my brothers, my, my, one of my closest, my best friend in the world, who was a big brother to me. And so this, this poem is dedicated to Jamar Huffman and it's entitled On Becoming Men. Remember Mickey D's in the summers after track? It was 1989, before my parents divorced, before your pops got sick. Back then, we ran in heats. Our young pumas would barely touch the lane running, running, running too fast to see the incoming. So all we understood about being boys and becoming men. And so I'll conclude by just saying that, you know, as you grow up, you know, if you're a young child out there, a young man, young woman out there, or if you have young women, young men in your life, those strengthen those relationships that they build with their friend, their friends and, and their siblings, their cousins. The strength in them knowing that there's someone going through them going through the madness with them, whatever the madness that may be, if they're going through a divorce or if they're just having a hard time at school, they're strengthening those sibling, those sibling bonds, those uh, friendship bonds that develop organically. And so I'll end by saying that though I'm a product of a single parent home, I'm also a product of the village. And I'm just one example of what it looks like when the village takes a hold. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And next we'll move to Dr. Adisa. Thank you very much. And I just want to say how wonderful it is to be a part of this and thank the organizer. And I also want to say how much information has been shared, you know, first by Faraha, who starts and with the slavery and the historical um, presence of uh, African people in the diaspora, but And then um, really want to thank Donna for her wonderful presentation of two of my favorite authors, Alex Walker and Nancy, and particularly the third, Mike Bridge Cooper. And then Jason, I really, it's really so important what you said about it doesn't matter where if you're raising a single parent household as long as there's a father present and the whole notion of setting an example. So I really want to thank you. Thank you. 
phones before you got home, and there were no cell phones, and many of us didn't even have phones, but somehow the news traveled. And we were corrected, you know, um, by anyone, anywhere, and we were expected to take it to humanity and, and to respond to it in a very positive way. So for me, when I think about the character, And I want to start with this poem from my collection, Caribbean and Tasha. And it's called Sunny People. And it really celebrates what we need is the culture of the Caribbean that is the same in this country and many others. And that defines its own sense of what family is. Sunny people, cinnamon brown to coffee black, not neck tint to copper toad, carrying the smell of pain. Nammy green bananas and tally for foreign solidity. Seasoning all the needs with coconut milk, very hopeful people. So many people playing jacks and cricket, gathering for ring games and soccer matches, transforming the six fight in the dam, burying the Mauritius behind white skin, holding guard most of the time their eyes elsewhere from the immediate squalor others would have them accept and them last. Awesome, transcending people. Swimmy people, shut out and hustling in the grill and crossroads, Port of Spain and Lavish Hill, Port of Prince and Lemonade, Curacao and Aruba, San Juan and New York, bathing in buckets, washing clothes at the river, at the sandpipe, nightly rinsing out the ones who uniform so that each morning the six of them clean and freshly pressed, hard work in the so many people keeping their ancestors close, putting out food for the dummies and sandals, who dream and guide them through trouble and bad minds, sprinkling salt from the sukuyan, guarding the children from the mother who sharpening and raising the machetes and cutlers in work and spend, resting from noonday under the zabaco, mango, flamboyant, immovable, wicked people. So many people speaking cringish and Spanish, supplemental and creole, inventing new terms, chatting all the time, reciting and telling them stories, dancing the Bombay and the Tena, moving to the Hulu from the reggae to the Calypso called, refusing to be subdued, determined to get lives and examples, inventing tenacious people. So the people with them, plenty, plenty laugh and good good time selves, with touchy touchy hands that always connect with life, dispossessed, malign, live of spirited souls, from Ghana to South Carolina, Jamaica to Nigeria, Haiti to Alabama, people to St. John, Finny people, then palm to my warm and loving, raising to my feet, singing me home, giving me back. And that for me is what Caribbean practice is. And as I, I, I want to say that we have more in common than um, we often acknowledge. And what for me is also very symbolic of Caribbean family and another great writer from the Caribbean, which is the African American heritage, Paul Marshall, talked about, you know, sitting at the kitchen table and how much of our history and our culture and who we are shared over meals, how much of who we are is shared by the fact that we talk with our hands, we touch, we hold on to each other, we lean into each other and we laugh and we sing and we dance. But at the heart of that is the mother. And that was certainly true for me. Um, my parents were divorced and like me, my father was still in my life for a big part of it and who also influenced the kind of woman I am and the kind of men I were attracted to, but it was my mother who was the group, my mother who was in Donatello. And so this poem is for my mother who died two years ago, and it's called I Remember Knowing You Sleep. And one of the things that I remember about my mother is her laughter. The worst thing for that time, she'd laugh, but we know that we oftentimes, as Donna has said, laugh heal the pain, use laughter to produce a bridge that gets us from one place to 
the next where it seemed impossible. And my mother had that gift and used it. And, and I think my ch children would say that when mommy gets upset or whatever, sometimes she laughs and you know, they're just not quite sure what it is. For a very long time, I believe you were invincible. And still today, you are indomitable. Mommy, I used to call you until at 10, I challenged you to call me Dara's daughter. You laughed at me and I retorted with Kathy. And that's how we did this then, Kathy, you mother, you father, you the world. I remember over here in Mexico how you were Coca-Cola bottle shaped in your hospital. I remember feeling proud that you were desired. You, my mother, your face always dancing with laughter, your heart always how did you manage to be so resilient, so sure, so optimistic? Can I tell you the consternation Dawn and I felt when we lost the 25 days for our preparatory school fees? But you never sang them. I don't even remember you yelling, just had a way you had to be found. Mostly I remember how easily you dressed down others with your tongue, your mastery of how everyone, men and women, rich and poor, respected you, gave you for advice, asked you to be godmother for your children, how generous you were, are, sharing all you have, willing to teach what you knew, and always doing something. I wonder if that's why I'm always going to be. Mostly I want to thank you for being beautiful, steady. I sat between your thighs, my elbows and arms rested on your knees. My head sometimes cradled between your hands as you chalked and plaited my ears. I knew from the love you brushed into it, I was beautiful and asked everything to Thank you, my mother. So there are other rituals around family that still exist in the Caribbean, even as fractured as we have become, particularly in the rural areas. And again, it has to do with that domestic spirit and how we create a vision of that domestic spirit. The kind of discussion that happens between women when we plait or braid or weave or whatever it is we do to our senior. The conversations that have to take with sense in terms of let me borrow a little salt or a little black pepper or a little stuff. Let me share what I've grown from my yard. That is what family needs. And what it still means to a lot of us in the charity and as factors as it might have been being becoming. And at the center of that is the woman. And I think a poem that I want to share, which is not my own, but uh, one of my favorite Caribbean poets, Nancy Moreton from Cuba, the Afro Caribbean poet who is just 90 miles from Jamaica. I won't share the entire poem, but I want to share some of this poem by Nancy, it's Black Woman. It's one of her very famous anthology poem. And it, it goes into the history, but I will just read some excerpts from it. Still, I smell the foam of the sea which they made me cross. The night I cannot remember, not even the ocean itself could remember it. But I do not forget the first gannet I made out. High, the clouds like innocent I witnessed. Perhaps I have not forgotten even my lost hope or my ancestral tongue. They left me here and here I have lived, and because I worked like a beast here I was born again to know how many mandinga did I try to have equal. I rebelled. His honor bought me in a square. I embroidered it up. His honor coat and gave birth to a son for him. My son had no name, and his honor he died at the hands of impeccable English dogs. I walked. This is the land in which I suffered sin and flogging. I rode the length of all its rivers. Under its sun I sowed, I reaped, I did not eat the harvest. For a house I had a shack. I myself brought stones to build it, but I sang to the natural beauty of the national bird. I rose up. It is the same land I touch and 
healing, blood, and the fruit to grow a holy other, brought this or not the same as that. But then I did not imagine the way to give it any more. Was it to give it to the man? Was it to matter that star or to keep her? I worked much harder. And I'm sick of it. I came down from the city to the end of capital and misery to generals and bourgeois leaders. Now I am only today to have I created. Nothing is outside of the beach. Ours the land, ours the sea and the sky, our magic and the chimera, my equal. Here I watch them glad around the tree which is planned before coming in there, which could be just wood on the little down. And, and what I like about this poem is something that I think sometimes you forget that part of the family is the land and our home is to the land, our connection to nature, and how despite all that we have endured, nature is part of the family that we bring into our midst. Because not only does it sustain us in terms of beauty, it is from the land that we get the food that we nurture. So we cannot dis disallow or forget nature in terms of when we look at Caribbean family and how connected we are to the land and how much part of the land the family is to us. And so um, I want to really just close uh, so that we can have a conversation by saying, uh, reading a poem about family for the next generation, and it's called The War, Miss Big Lady, and it's for my daughter. So you are five, well, I have two daughters, so <laughs> I should speak, uh, it, it's for my oldest daughter, show. So you are five, growing, grow wanting to know what I'm going to do when I grow up. Maybe I'll be like you, or maybe I'll be shy, more reserved. You speak for both of us, sometimes too bossy, most times too defiant, always with a billion conspiracies. But I must teach you to admit what you don't know. I must help you to harness your energy and temper your enthusiasm. I must teach you to pride and show you that you know you can be a crowd of glory. I must love you fiercely, but help to guide you to all your potential. I must be your advocate, your coach, your cheerleader your mother and friend, this five-year-old grown baby, slow down. And she's hammered. And in a sense, here's what Jason said about how because his nephew was in the car, he had to get it together and not show anger because he knew that he was modeling for that future generation. And so when we think about that family, we have to think about continuity. We have to think about what is it is we're modeling for the next generation, what it is we're bringing them. Because if we say they do not know the history, it is because we have not shared it with them. So what is it that we now have to ensure that this generation of black people, who are perhaps the most divided from their ancestral, and in some ways the most connected because of the virtual web space, so that there is that connection that can happen. Um, you know, what is it that we need to be taught to them about family? Of course, they're going to put their own needs on it. And certainly one of the things I wanted to impart to my three children, and I hope they would concur in this, is of course that love is foundation. And that even in slavery, we have ample evidence that we love each other. If we did not, we would not have been there. Even though self-hatred and self-denial was we never all surrender to that, or we would not be here now as a black family throughout the diaspora. So it is to, it's to feel love. It is to feel an awareness of self and that you belong. My ancestors, our ancestors, have paved the way so that we belong to whatever we want to be in the world. It is ours. And we need to take it as Africa, as a continent. It's on the rise and will be a leader in this coming next day. And so the black family is very important. Self-pride, self-awareness, dignity, respect, resourcefulness, and that's the family that I come from. And I'm very grateful and thankful for all the many aunts and uncles and cousins and fathers.
Thank you, Dr. Odessa, for that presentation and thank all of our panelists. Uh, there is a question in the chat box and it was directed towards Dr. Odessa and it is, is the connection to the land still sustained in the city, concrete skyscrapers? Not so much, not so much. The interesting thing about Kingston where I live, which is an urban is that you will go into one of these forest areas and you will see people still planting things. And because we are a people who drive around Kingston in the forest areas where people who eat fruit and while a lot of them come from the rural areas, we still grow things. And so I still think there is a connection to the land. Um, you know, extractive, extractivism has been a very much a part of the diaspora and Africa that is taken from our sour bauxite, our diamonds, our gold. And we're now looking at that. We're fighting for various areas like Coppage Country in Jamaica. And it is a widespread group of people of Jamaica who have come to protect that. So we understand the importance of that, even as we have become less mindful of the plastic pollution and other things like that. So yes, I would say that there is it's not as strong, but it is still evident and we're certainly working to feel more resilient around connection to that. Thank you. Okay, we're waiting to see if there are any other questions in the chat box. There aren't at this moment, but I have a question. I wanted to ask Ms. Youngblood to explain a little to, the, to our audience about the concept of the cat-eyed woman from Louisiana. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I did, I unmuted myself. And it came about because uh, I was in a sort of like on again, off again relationship with somebody. And um, he, he said, you just like them old cat-eyed women from Louisiana who will cut you, you know? And I, tell, I said, but I am not a violent person. I am, I, I, and that would be the last thing that I would ever do would, would be to cut anybody. But that's how he, he described me as one of them cat-eyed women from Louisiana who would cut you. And so I guess women in Louisiana, some of them had that reputation, but it it was not me. I would never, mm -mm, I, I have never carried a switchblade. I don't carry a knife. And I, I have been known to bite somebody when they made me mad, but that's about as much as I've ever done in terms of <laughs> cutting anybody. <laughs> but that's where it came from. Raha is my friend, and I just want to say a big hello to her and how much I love and I miss you. So I want to just say that publicly. And I just want to say, in relationship to that question, that maybe his, his description was a woman who did that, but just the way in which you could look at somebody, for Raha, and I know you can, and cut them. <laughs> so it's not a physical thing, you know, it's just like I'm reading you, and you better stop what you're doing. My well, that, that's something that I inherited from my mother, that look. She could give you a look. She didn't have to say a word. I mean, not a word. And so my kids tell me that I have that, that I can, I can just look and I don't, they understand perfectly. And it's not just my kids. Other people that I've known have also said it. I was never really aware of that, but they just said that, you know, when something came up and I didn't say anything, but they could tell from just the way I looked, my eyes, the way my eyes would go and I would look and that, that just explained everything. But I'm trying to monitor how I, how I look at people. And something that really came up that, that was really interesting, it was a question about uh, the, how the eyes expressed. It was something that I read, I think I may have read it on the Daily Own somewhere about how the eyes, it's, oh, uh, it was a, from a song, I Cried For You, that's what it was. It was something that I had responded to was I was, I was trying to 
write out something. And then this song came on by Billie Holiday, Lady Day, I Cried For You. And I was thinking how we, how we use our eyes. And now that most of us have to wear masks because of the pandemic, it is even more telling how we can read people's eyes because we are no longer distracted by any other thing on their faces. And you can really read how people communicate now with their eyes. And it's, it's amazing. It is absolutely amazing because when I'm here, and of course, it's a Spanish speaking country and my Spanish is, I can get by, but I'm not fluent. And so now that we have the mask on, when I'm out in a public space and I see somebody and, 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 and Panamanians always greet you, no matter where you are, or wherever, whatever you're doing, it's always hola, buena, or whatever. And now they simply greet you with their eyes. They, it, it is the most wonderful thing when they do that. They don't, they don't speak, you know, because they, they express it now with eyes as you're in passing and they just give you this look. That, that, is, that is a greeting, and it's really nice to be able to do that. Well, that's a good segue to the next question that someone has in the chat box. In what ways, positive and negative, do you think the pandemic is impacting the Black family dynamic? And well, that's for everybody. Well, it certainly is um, impacting the Black family dynamic worldwide. It's impacting all families. Um, of some negative impact, and that is there's a tremendous, because of my work, there's a tremendous increase in gender-based violence, violence against women and um, girls, and the, the, the data is worldwide, so it's not a particular specific or the Caribbean, but the data is alarming, and what it shows, particularly for people in small quarters, you know, the pandemic is fine if everybody has a room and you have a living room and you have all of that. We know that in the Caribbean, in Africa, in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, people don't have those things. And so it is, it is, it has placed a tremendous challenge on families. The greatest challenge has been to children in rural areas in Jamaica who don't have internet, who don't have laptops or tablets. And we estimate, which I think is a modest estimate, that about 40,000 children have not gotten an education in the last year and a half. And a few teachers have been applauded because one teacher rides on his bicycle and delivers, makes copies of work to distribute to children in rural area. Another woman teacher goes to the community and writes on a blackboard every day the lessons because in those neighborhoods, those children don't have access to internet or books. So on the one hand, we find we see the violence and the abuse, but on the other hand, we also see people coming together. And one of the things that I've heard consistently from parents is that their children, most of their children, apart from missing their families, their friends enjoy being home. And they've had time to share stories and to engage in their in with their children that they haven't had. And this is the report that's coming through, not just from Jamaica, but the Caribbean. So that's a positive way that COVID has impacted us, of course. There are other negative implications, and I'll bring to someone else. Here in Panama, here in Panama, the, the, the greatest, the, the most devastating impact is the economy. Um, it's, it's, I live in a, in a fairly impoverished area. I live on the Atlantic Caribbean side of the country. And the economy in terms of the Afroantianos, what they call the Afroantianos uh, community, because they're really five, five groups, hierarchies here. At the very top are the Panamanians of European descent, basically from Spain and um, France and maybe Germany. And then and just below them are the Panamanians of Latin descent from other Latin American countries. And then at the third level, you have the Afroantianos. These are the ones who came primarily from Jamaica and Barbados, 
to build the canal and to build the railroad. And then below them are the enslaved Africans who came in with the Spaniards. And at the very bottom are the indigenous groups like the Gunayala and people like that. And so they've already, so those that are at the bottom of the, of the ladder have, have, have suffered most in this pandemic because they are no, they're not able to go out and, and work. And the government, uh, even though the government is not requiring people to pay their utilities or anything like that, without a source of income, people are finding it difficult to feed their families and they, we don't, they don't have the resources here in this country like you have perhaps in the United States where you have organizations that can pull together and feed people. Because I've been looking at the uh, images from the states where people are in these long lines to get food. But here in Panama, it's um, where I live. It, it's it's the, the government is not able to uh, keep the infrastructure going. The, the, the streets are crumbling. The, the trash pickup is really horrible. Uh, clean water to drink is not really happening. And all of that, again, is a, is a result of the government not being able to have the income coming in that it usually does. And then the other impact here is that families, uh, like I said, these are multi-generational families and most people wear masks, but some of them don't. And because they're so accustomed to always being together, every evening you'll find the families outside listening to music and the young kids are running around playing and the teenagers are having their music and the older people are sitting out having their cerveza and chatting and laughing and all of that. And so it's like they are paying no attention to this pandemic. It's like it, it's not even here. And so sometimes when I go outside of my, my gate and I see the kids outside and I just tell them, I said, donde esta tu mascarilla? You know, where's your mask? And they are very respectful. And, you know, if they're not wearing one, they'll go and get one and put it on because this virus, this virus, as they call it, is, is, is serious. It is serious. It's impacting very much here in Panama, we're still under quarantine. On this side, as I said, I'm on the, uh, the uh, Atlantic Caribbean side, but on the Pacific side, they are under quarantine where they are uh, under lockdown on weekends. They, they're not, yeah. And, and so that's still happening because it's more densely populated on the Pacific side where you have all of the skyscrapers and you have all of the multi story buildings and you have all of that. But there are so many stores that have gone out of business. The businesses have folded here in this country as they have in other places. And so the, the pandemic has, has hit hard here. It really has. And, and I'm seeing it up close because of where I am, because this is kind of like a, a village, a small town, and everybody knows everybody. And we've lost uh, some people to the, uh, the virus. We've lost people to it. But again, the economic toll has been devastating here. Would any of the other panelists like to address the question? I'll just say that uh, I've seen creative things that are happening with uh, the families where people are able to be together. So grandparents are becoming teachers. One of my friends always says she's doing teacher duty with her grandchild. She's having to help with the lessons. And conversely, for the families who are not together, it's stressful, particularly at times of loss, because the grieving process has just radically shifted. When uh, I've lost people in my family and I am not able to travel to be there for the homegoing services. So some things we can manage creatively, reading stories over FaceTime or Zoom to maintain a presence of other family members in the household, but other things simply can't be replaced. And the number one thing is the hug, the touch. We talked about using the eyes, but that hug is impossible to administer uh, through the computer. I guess to... Uh to answer the question from my perspective, you know, with everything being remote, things move so quickly. They have so many deadlines and so many things that I have on my plate. And so I have to be intentional about checking in on elders and, other, and my siblings and my friends and just really be um, just intentional about making, making sure I check on folks and see how they're doing, you know, see if there's anything I could do to help. 
Okay. There's another question in our chat. And the question is, when we think of the Black family from an expansive perspective, do we need to continue conversations about children living in single family households? I mean, I think we, we do need to always have those conversations, not only children living in single households, uh, arise in the Caribbean and arise in the African American community, because I lived in California and was very intimate with the African American community. There's an increase in children in, in, in homes, in foster homes, in government care homes. We, we need to have that conversation. We also, I think, need to have an intergenerational conversation. You know, when I was growing up, we went to a party, there was everybody. Grandma was dancing, mom was dancing, the child was dancing. And we still see some of that in the Caribbean, but it's now more and more moving because of, you know, the space and the influence of the media. It's more moving to generations existing on their own, which I don't think is a good trend. So I definitely think we do need to have the conversation about single family households because no child was brought in single early and we need to change that trend and it doesn't mean that people in my book have to be married or whatever, but those key persons who conceive that child, created that child, need to be actively participating in that child's life. I think it puts an unfair burden on the parent who is the single parent. And, and so I think we definitely need to have that conversation, but I do think we need to also have the conversation about the vast number of black children who are born into all kinds of homes. You know, when I was growing up, children weren't put into homes. If the parents couldn't be there, I an auntie or somebody who didn't have children or somebody, you know, the child was taken to a home. And it's not always necessarily here for our love, but most often times they were. Now they're in government run homes for years. And that's I think we definitely need to have that conversation. I agree. I think we need to I don't think we need to normalize divorce, but I think we need to normalize what can happen in relationships with children at an early age. Because one thing I was missing was that, you know, as a, as a child who grew up in a single parent home, I didn't understand why mom and dad weren't together. But I think if I had gained an understanding earlier, that would have, you know, led to more positive relationships as I've grown and matured. Because as a, as a person who's gone through that, I've grown up with abandonment issues. You know, I've grown up with, you know, every girlfriend had to be the one. You know, if we broke up, something was wrong with me. You know, if we broke up, then, you know, I can't sustain a relationship. And I think that's wrong. I think that, you know, we need to do better, I guess, collectively in educating children on what relationships can and should look like at an early age. Would any of our other panelists like to address this question? I didn't grow up in a single parent household. Um, my parents were together until my mother passed away, but I did become a single parent for my first three children. And um, it, it, it never occurred to me that I could not take care of them. It never occurred, and, and, and even though I was a single parent, my children had their cousins and and my mother and 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 you know when we were all living together uh in southern california which is basically where my my kids grew up they had their cousins and they had you know their grandmother and their grandfather and so their their early years were spent as part of an extended family uh and it was not until i moved away to seek a, a better um uh, better conditions, you know, to earn a living, to take care of myself and them. That's when the uh, separation from my my birth family occurred. But where I moved to, I quickly established an extended family there of aunties and aunts. You know, my friends who became the aunties and aunts because, like, my children still call Opal Auntie Opal. 
and they and they still call the you know people that they've known all their lives and they and my children i'm old school and so my children even though they are grown now they call my friends and older people they give them a title it's either tonton which is my, my youngest child because she speaks french but she calls tonton or it's uncle or it's aunt or it's tante or it's tia and so and to give them that respect but i established a family after I moved away from Southern California and my children didn't have their cousins and grandparents around them, but they had the family that I established for them when we moved to Northern California. Okay. Thank so just you. Just before I leave, I just want to say thank you for the organizer of this. This is really wonderful. And that we need to have many more sessions like these, not just one to them. And just because in the chat, uh, the first poem I read about is from my collection, Caribbean Passion. And the poem I read from my mother is from my collection, Cameron and Mango Woman. And I just want to say a big shout out and thank you to Donna and JP and to Sarah and to you too, Daphne, for being the moderator. Thank you all. And um, sorry that I have to run because I have another meeting. Bless you. And thank you. Strong, strong, strong. So we're going to end soon. We want to thank you for joining us this evening. And we'd like to again, thank the US Embassy Ghana American Corner for their support and collaboration on this program. Uh, we'll be putting some links uh, this evening in uh, the chat if you're interested in finding out more about our authors. Um, I also want to thank our panelists it was a wonderful discussion and discourse on the topic of seeing the Black family through your lenses and also the lenses of the other authors, uh, poets, and writers that you reference. Uh, we want our audience to join us next Tuesday, February 23rd, for the last in our series. And the topic will be the depiction of the Black family in the media. We'll be, we'll be looking at the visual arts, film, theater, and television. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope you enjoyed our presentation.